I'm Paul Root Walby, Director of the Center for Ethics. This is part of our Ethics in the Arts program that we call Ethics on the Stage. <coughs> our Director of the Ethics in the Arts program, Carlton Mackey, also today is going to double as a uh, actual um, commentator and guest star of this uh, event and um, very happy to have him with us. This is a dis performance and discussion or a reading and discussion of By the Way Vera Stark, a uh, play starting shortly at the Alliance that has some really interesting um, twists and turns in it and some deeply social, racial, historical, <laughs> gender, ethical issues. Got it all. So uh, I am sure that you're going to want to see it uh, uh, if you don't already have tickets. Um, it, it's really one of, one of the great pleasures for me of doing this is I get to read the scripts ahead of time and then I get to see the shows and it's been a wonderful education to read these scripts and then not being in theater myself and seeing how they get realized on the stage. It's just been, been doing it now for how many years have we been doing this? Since 2010. Yeah, so we've been doing it for three years. So that's just been one of the delights for me and I'm really curious how they're going to actualize this one. That's, uh, this is one of the ones when I'm reading going, really? They're going to do that? Let's see how they're going to do that. <laughs> um, so I think you will all be delighted by it. Um, we have a wonderful panel of guests. Leah Gardner, who's the director of, uh, by the way, Vera Stark. So Lisa Coffey, who those of you who have been here before, have met before, the director of New Projects at Alliance, and the person we work with on this program. Uh, the woman who needs no introduction, <laughs> Pearl Klieg, playwright and artist in residence. Is that your? Playwright in residence. Playwright in residence at, uh, at Alliance and Carlton Mackey, who I uh, introduced to already, who is not only the director of our Ethics in the Arts program, but the, in his other life, what I actually pay him for is to be the assistant director of the Ethics and Servant Leadership Program, where he is an extraordinary teacher and mentor to um, some of the best students here at Emory. So this is going to be a, a wonderful evening, and I'm going to ask so Lisa, to introduce it. Uh, this is a tricky wicket of a play. Usually with a play, we have a director, we have actors, we have <coughs> lights and costumes and sound, and you put the play on. And by the way, Meet Fair Stark, we have to make a movie. And not only do we have to make a movie, the movie has to feel like it was made in 1933. <laughs> so we did. What well, was it, two weeks ago? We made a movie. This is a play about making a movie, and you have to make the movie. So the movie is called The Bed of Bell of New Orleans. You have to buy a ticket, and you can, my colleague Celeste over there is selling tickets. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, a, there's a lot about this play that we're not going to see tonight by <coughs> design, because the movie isn't quite done yet, even though it's very old, because you'll feel like it was made in 1933. Actually, it was made two weeks ago. <laughs> um, and, and this movie, this fictional movie, has the cultural weight of, say, Gone with the Wind except it was made earlier and in black and white, right? <laughs> so it has been playing on TV, it is a huge deal. And it has made its star, uh, Vera Stark, who plays a maid, it has made her a star. And the play, along with having to make a movie, is a tricky wicket of a play, because it takes a place in 1933 when it's written to be a screwball comedy, and we're not going to do the funny parts tonight, so you'll have to come to the theater to see the 1933 parts. And they are hilarious because it's a screwball comedy about things that people did not talk about when they were writing 1933 screwball comedies. And so our uh, uh, playwright, Lynn Nottage, did it for us. And it's so in the period of time, and it's so completely politically incorrect, Act One. And um, my intern said it best when he said he watched who watched a uh, run through the show, and he said he had to go home and ice his cheeks from laughing. Um, okay. So then the second act, in the second act, we have to make a TV show, a 1973 TV show on the stage, which has been found in a dusty compartment or file cabinet or something somewhere, probably in New York. Um, and it has been resuscitated uh, to be shown by a panel, not unlike the <coughs> panel you have tonight. So we thought, oh, we have this amazing opportunity to be at the Center for Ethics. Let's do the panel part of the play at a panel. 
So that is the, the plan. Um, but in order to kind of set up the panel, we thought we would really delve into what we never get to do in theater, which is really just talk about all the issues that are raised in the play. And so we're going to start out with Pearl and Carlson, who both read the play and thought about it. And Pearl's thought about it. I mean, you and Susan had long, long, Susan Booth, our artistic director, conversations about this play and the issues it raises. Um, and usually when we're writing marketing copy, right, we say, it's so much fun. You'll laugh a lot. That's what the marketing department told me to say. But because I'm at Emory and we're at the Center for Ethics, I can say, yeah, that too. But it also is incredibly thought-provoking. We've had the most, some of the most amazing conversations about representation and race and, um, and, and uh, plays and theater in the rehearsal hall. Um, and it's all done in a very entertaining package, but it's kind of nice. We've all been looking forward to being here tonight and really getting ta to talk about some of the more substantive issues that um, are in the play. So uh, with that, should I turn, Pearl, sure. is that enough of a setup about the yeah, play sure. and what it is? Sure, sure. And we can talk about some of the things the play makes you think. I think that's um, interesting that you said that about marketing, because when we first started talking about the play, and they asked me to read it and what do you think about it, so in order to say what you think about it, you have to talk a lot, like Salisa, to say this is what it means. But that can't be useful for marketing. Right. So what I said was, okay, what does a marketing person need to know about this play? And my quote for the play, which I subsequently began to see on billboards and everywhere. things, says, <laughs> everywhere, Pearl Clegg says, yeah. Vera Stark is a fabulous force of nature. <laughs> which is true, but it's also such a, such a kind of condensation of everything that the play is about, that sometimes I want to say that. Pearl Clay could have talked a little more about <laughs> all of that. Um, I don't in any way um, need to speak for this play. This is a very complex, um, interesting play, but one of the, there's so many issues that you can talk about um, in it, issues of color, issues of um, discrimination, issues of identity, of um, how you see yourself and how others see you, how they define you and how you allow yourself to be defined, which I'm sure we will talk more about. But the thing that really struck me as I read the play again today, thinking about coming here, um, is that, should I stand up some yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm so sorry, I'm looking at somebody's looking at me through the people like that. Um, one of the things that really struck me is that part of what Vera is angry about and what um, some of the other um, African-American actresses at the start of this play are angry about is they're only asked to play maids. They're only asked to play maids in the play, in the movies. They're only asked to play maids. And they're very complicated, very sophisticated women, but they only get to play maids all the time. Now this is not a discussion that is unfamiliar to me in the present day. Um, the last time I had this discussion about the maids and how come we always have to play maids, that discussion was around the help with Viola Davis. Most of you saw the help. Um, every woman that I know, African American woman that I know, had a very strong opinion about that movie, about the casting of Viola Davis in that movie, about the response to Viola Davis. And we not only had it when it was all African American women, but we also had it when we would go to the movies. If you went to a movie where everybody in the audience was African American, it was a different kind of experience. Many of my friends had the experience of going to see it in an integrated setting, which made the white women who were there uncomfortable sometimes because a lot of what was going on was not very good about what these women were doing in Mississippi. So they would turn to my friends who had never seen them before and apologize for the old days. I'm so sorry, that was so terrible, wasn't it? Now, you're trying to watch a movie and someone's trying to talk about racial guilt <laughs> and the old South and all of that, so it raises very complicated questions. For me, it raised complicated questions because I think Viola Davis is an amazing, amazing actor. And I also see pictures of her in her real life, and she is like so suave and so sophisticated and so wonderful looking. And then I go see The Help and she's like, really not anything like that, which is a tribute to how great an actress she is, but also makes me wish I could one time see her in something where she got to be, how she looked in LA Magazine where she was so fabulous I couldn't believe it was her. So my comment that I kind of just want to say about the Vera Stark with the maid issue is that it's a very contemporary issue. And I want to share with you a letter that I wrote 
to Viola Davis, who I do not know, after I read an article in Newsweek where she was talking about the reaction she had gotten to playing a maid in The Help. And she was kind of hurt by it, but she said, you know, I, I did my job. I don't think it's a, a problem to play a maid, all of those questions. But it made me um, really think about the dilemma that she was in, in terms of also wanting to play a person more like she was. So being a writer, I wrote her a letter. Mm -hmm. April 16, 2012. Dear Viola Davis, as a longtime admirer of your work, I followed the run-up to this year's Oscars with great interest. But of all the interviews and articles with and about you, the one that made the most lasting impression on me was your comment in the January 30th, 2012 issue of Newsweek concerning the paucity of roles for, quote, a 46-year-old black actress who doesn't look like Halle Berry. I have an absolute understanding and awareness of the image I project, and there are just not a lot of roles for women who look like me, end quote. Your statement made me feel sad and mad in equal measure, especially since I couldn't even figure out how to lodge an effective protest against such an injustice. So I paced around my living room raving to my husband about how I longed to see you play a character as sophisticated and confident and powerful as you looked in the February issue of the LA Times Magazine, a character with a sex life. The Newsweek article also said you were, quote, the only actor at the table who hasn't had a chance to experience romantic chemistry on screen. When I finally stopped fussing, my husband said calmly, I think you're looking at this all wrong. He was asking for trouble, but I took a deep breath. <laughs> How's that, I said. She doesn't need a protest, he said. She needs a playwright. <laughs> well, that's what I am, a playwright. So it's my great pleasure to send you my new play, What I Learned in <laughs> <laughs> which will open the season at Atlanta's Alliance Theater this fall. The main character, Evie Madison, a 50-ish black woman, is worldly, smart, well-traveled, and much loved. The play, a romantic comedy set in Atlanta in 1963, 1973, catches a group of longtime friends and political insiders at the moment they are fully realizing just how bright the light is, which will now be shining not only on their victorious candidate, but on each of them as well. I invite you to read the play, hoping, of course, that you will see yourself bringing Evie to full life for the first time here in Atlanta in September. Failing that, I offer this play as your proof, should you ever need it, that there is at least one writer whose life's work is about creating wonderful roles for women who look just like you. Best wishes for continued success with your work, and thank you for taking a look at what I learned in Paris. With great respect and profound admiration, I am Pearl Clay at the Alliance Theater. So I think my lesson, thank you, my lesson from Vera Stark and from Viola Davis and from all of these women is that while we fuss about it and think about it and try to figure it out, is that we have to continue doing the work that we do. So that's what answer? I have to say about Vera. Did you get an answer? No, I never did. <laughs> but you never know if the person actually got it. You know, they got agents and all of that. So I did my best to go through the channels and get it to her. But if I ever see her, I'm going to say, don't ever say, Nobody's writing for you, because I know that I am, and I know that other women playwrights are. So, you know, I don't want, I always feel badly when actors feel like they're not offered roles and those roles aren't being written. Sometimes the roles they're being offered are not being processed by people who even see them in the way that I would be seeing them or writing about them. So I always want actors to be aware that there are people writing different kind of work than they might be offered. Um, and that we're doing it right here in Atlanta. So, welcome. So, I, I appreciate that uh, we couldn't have planned it better in one sense because you were talking about doing the work. And uh, I'm an artist, and Dr. Wolf has given you some introductions to the other work that I do. But, but tonight, I'd like to speak from the perspective of an artist who's trying to do work that is at the intersection <clears throat> of um, helping people explore and examine the way in which they've been formed and shaped to understand their identities. Um, I believe that art is a powerful force, and I believe in the power of art to change the world. And that is where I start and I stand, and that's kind of like my proclamation you know, that I offer before I say anything. Um, but I'm also raising a son who is biracial. And in beginning to try to understand uh, or preempt or think about his identity in context to my own, you know, I've, I've started thinking about the question of how would he answer the question, who are you? And as I begin to think about that question, I begin to ask myself that question. And it's the question that in reading this play, um, and I'll begin my, the, the comments that I have to make tonight with posing them to you. Because though this play has a lot to do with race, and uh, Pearl and I are speaking from the perspective of, of, of 
from the African-American perspective, questions about identity and the complexity of identity and even how we shape how we see ourselves is not a question that's unique to the African-American experience. It's not a question that's unique to being African-American, period. Um, so it's a question that I want to pose to you all right now. You don't have to answer out loud, but I just want to ask it out loud so that it, you can hear it being asked, and I want you to sit with it, and then I'll offer some other questions. I'm going to, well, I won't look at anyone in particular. <laughs> um, so the question I have for you tonight is, who are you? Now, when you think about that question, when we think about the answer that you give, the first answer that, that we may give may be from a religious perspective. I am Jewish. I am Christian. We may offer one that, that is connected to our ethnic or racial identity. I am black. I am Native American. I am Portuguese. I am, you know, fill in the blank. It may be um, an answer that we say immediately that is directly connected to our sexual orientation, our sex, the way in which we express ourselves sexually. Um, we, could, we could say something about, you know, our sexual identity. Um, those are the answers that we give may change if I were to ask you that in this context or if you were standing in line at the grocery store and someone asked who you were or if you were at a place of worship and someone asked or if you were in the quiet recesses of your own mind and someone asked you that question. And what in thinking about this play and in thinking about the title that we'd even use to kind of examine the work that we'd be doing tonight. Um, I kind of tossed some emails to, to Salisa and we came up with, uh, what, is, what is our subtitle tonight? Um, identity and the passing and the complex landscape of identity formation. Because for me, in the work that I'm doing, um, in the work that I do with my students, I think about how our identities are formed and it's a constant dialogue both between <coughs> how we see ourselves in dialogue with how we see other people and in constant dialogue with how we think other people see us. And sometimes we're performing, we're behaving based on that when we're in isolation or when we're in other people. If I'm standing next to my sister right here, it's both an interpretation of how I see myself in her eyes, that if I wasn't sharp, it may influence even how I see myself and how I answer that question. Because I'm acting based on what I may perceive as her perception of me. Now imagine if it is the baseline understanding of ourselves that when, in the, when we enter a room, the context is, and we bought into the belief that the people who are looking at us see us as less than them. How might that shape the way we see ourselves? What would it mean if we walk into a room and the baseline perception is that people see us as better than them? What would it do if we see, if we walk into a room and the context or, or, the, or the situation is based on our sexuality or laws that there are that, that, that we are, we don't have to actually identify based on something that is who we are, but we can pass to get along. It's this constant dialogue in, our, in, the, in these contexts that we're in that I think we find these characters. It's this ongoing dialogue throughout the play of both how they see themselves, as Pearl mentioned, how other people see them, and how they see other people. And, and that is um, one of my students is here. Uh, who we've done an exercise called the ethics of identity. And we ha I had them write down on a piece of paper, um, take two minutes and write down exactly how you see yourself. Like, who are you? And so they started writing down. And then I listed all these names of, of only categories from the census, only options that you could choose from the census. I wrote them down on the piece of paper and I said, write down the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of these groups. So they wrote, some of them were hesitant, let me tell you. Like, you know, but I told them they, they, they didn't have to share it with anyone. And then I asked this question, and, it was, and, and, and it's a question that I'll pose to you all tonight as you think about your identity and the complexity of it. Um, airports are the world's best place for people watching, Atlanta airport in particular. <laughs> so I had them say, imagine that, as we all look at people in airports, I said, imagine that you are in the airport, <coughs> you're walking by, and there are people just like the sea of people right here. <coughs> um, um, and you enter in line, and you're about to exchange a ticket, and there's someone behind you, and you're just getting on the plane. I just said, how would the person behind you describe you? What would they say about you? And write that down. And then I asked them to see if what they wrote down based on the person who was perceiving them would be the same as what they wrote down in the very first exercise. 
some of them were the same, some of the adjectives that they used to describe themselves were the same, and some of them were totally different. And I asked them how would they perform if, and, and why did they say that they would perceive them in this way, and how would that impact their performance if the person started acting and engaging with them on the way, you know, mm -hmm. based on what they wrote in the last exercise. And they had to think about that. So what I'm, what I'm offering and what I'm sharing and the work that I'm doing, um, and I could talk more specifically as it relates to race, but what I wanted to open up this conversation is for us to not just think about these characters on this stage that we're going to look, do a song and dance and perform, but I want you to think about from the seats that you're in, what is your own ethics of identity? What is your own complex negotiated dialogue that you're having with yourselves and other people constantly? How does that impact how you see yourself? And what can you do about that perception based on how you engage with other people? So the work that I do seeks to open up, burst open the seams of looking at diversity and make it even more complex. Um, the title of the work that, I, that, I've, that I've created based on the stories of a lot of people from across the country and across the world, it's called Fifty Shades of Black and we can talk about what is blackness in this context. But I want to ask largely, what is any of our ethnic identities and how have we come, or our, or our identities based on our sexual orientation, because those are the two things that I look at mainly in this work. It's called Fifty Shades of Black and it's called A Critical Examination of Sexuality and Skin Tone in the Formation of Identity. So what are the ways in which you perceive your identity? What are the ways in which you, you, you perceive that other people perceive that identity? And how are you negotiating that? that performance or that identity in the context that we call the public and, and the sphere in which we constantly engage with other people on a regular basis. Before we continue, I do want to ask if um, anybody has a question or response or something they would like to say to either Pearl or Carlton. Um, I think it's just moving on right now doesn't feel right to me. So, yeah. I have a response to Carlton, and that is, I don't know, if you've heard any of Irie's new album, I have Song Conversation, she has a song called I Am Light. I am not the skin I'm in, I'm not this, that. And that's what I thought of. It's very interesting that you brought that up, and if I may respond to it, I haven't heard the song, I haven't heard the album. But interestingly enough, the first time that I heard about um, India's new album, was an online dialogue about the image that she shot for the cover. And whether or not she had gone undergone any um, skin lightening. Because the India that I knew from <clears throat> I am not my hair India looked more like me. The image that I saw online, she looked several shades lighter than me. And um, now granted, I don't know if that was manipulated or if that was people just starting controversy. But because so many people decided to comment on it and that was an engagement, it made me think about why is that still a conversation that's relevant? And what is it about, whether, what is it about people's preoccupation with their own skin tone and that of others that, um, that still impacts how people see themselves and how we, and how we, see, each, and, you know, how we see each other? So, um, I'm really disappointed by that because her album is brilliant. It's some of the best songwriting I've heard in a long time. Did you see the online thing about the artist who had people come in and could not, he could not see them, or she could not see them, who the artist was, and drew them from the person's own description? Huh. And I then did, you had somebody a... else come in and describe them, yeah. and they compared the two pictures? <coughs> that sounds to me very much like the kind of thing you're doing, but a little more. Uh, and, and the people's, if you want to say more for the people who haven't seen it, the people's perceptions of themselves or the way they describe themselves was, was almost consistently Plus. negative based yeah. on that. But, was there was, but there was a big gender difference. Mm -hmm. Women described themselves, when he drew the women's self-description, <coughs> the picture was much less flattering than when the woman's friend described her. The difference was much greater than when a man described himself and then a man's friend came in. <laughs> 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 an hour worth of stuff to say yeah, about that. Yeah. <laughs> i just tell you, I, I wrote a book, uh, a textbook many years ago on, on gender and sexuality. My favorite cartoon in that book was a man and his wife both standing in front of mirrors. <laughs> both of them were sort of middle-aged and 
you know, a little bit overweight, a little bit wrinkled, a little bit droopy. And the woman's looking at herself in the mirror, and what she sees is herself as a pear. And you look in the man looking in the mirror, and he sees himself as Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> that what will happen to that what happens to Vera Stark will also happen to Viola mm -hmm. and other black actresses. Today, Viola Davis is also I would say no. That is that there's there are many. Um, I think there are many more options certainly for black actors um, and actresses now than there were at that time. Many, many more. Um, the, the realms that people are choosing to work in often dictate what roles they're offered. If you're in a big budget Hollywood movie world, then there's a different kind of role that's going to be offered for you. And I think that's what Viola Davis was reacting to that world, saying that people in that world she's working in so successfully don't perceive her as a beautiful sexual woman. They perceive her in a certain way. And she was acknowledging that in terms of the roles that she's, um, that she's being offered in that world. But I think that's a choice to move around in that world, that there are other options, you know, where you can say, they're never going to love me. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to work in independent film. I'm going to work in this. And I think she does a lot of other kinds of work. But in that specific Hollywood big budget world, what she was saying in there, she's never going to get the romantic lead. That's always going to go to Halle Berry in that, in that, in that particular context. But I think one of the things she was also saying is that, we, that there needs to be more stories. And I guess what I'm wondering would you be able to move from playwright and just bring it? Will I be able to? Or would someone like you? Or sure, there's like lots of black know? women writing screenplays, lots. And not just here, all over the world. There's black women writing screenplays, directing movies, all of that. So that I, I think it's, it's there's a, a whole world of people doing a whole world of roles all over. So it's not, it's not so much that I need to move from playwriting to screenwriting. There's lots of bright black women writing wonderful screenplays and making movies with wonderful screenplays. So I'm, I'm going to stick to the stage. I'm good at the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to make a comment? Yes, please. Yeah, you know, um, hi guys. I, I, um, I, I am a theater director, but I am also a producer of film. And I just produced my first film called Mother of George, which is actually showing here um, in Atlanta at the moment, which is a great film. Uh, um, you have to ask yourself, to, to sort of speak to what you're saying, you have to ask yourself, and I'm sure, I'm just curious how many people in this room know, how many African American women have won? Which, which Academy Award? For, not for Best Supporting. Not for Best Supporting. So for the lead, lead lady, right, for the leading lady, how many won? I think so. Just Holly, right? Mm -hmm. And Holly won for a underprivileged mother. Who was she, or wasn't she on drugs? I can't even remember. She was, but she was a drinker. She was a drinker, right? The three, the three best supporting roles that women have won. What roles were they? A maid. What else? An abusive, a clairvoyant. an abusive mother, and then what was the other one? What did Whoopi play? A crackpot. A crackpot? But my point is, I mean, I think we all know what my point is. And then Pearl talks about, and, and rightly so, the number of African American women, and men for that matter, who are writing for the screen. The question is how many African American women and men are in positions of power where they can take these films and put them on the big screen and employ African American actors and biracial actors and people who just don't get to work a lot. And then the other point that I wanted to make was, you know, when you are in our industry, and I can speak for the four of us here, I mean, we're all very lucky because we are working in our, in our industry, and Pearl is working, and we are lucky people of color in this industry. Out of the five of us, you think how many 500 are not working. So when you look at your retirement plans as an artist in our industry, as people of color, 
our retirement plans don't necessarily look like those of people who work all the time. I am a working theater director all the time. But the theaters in which I am asked to work normally, really the last five years I finally started to work at the much larger theaters, my pension, and I am not ashamed to say, but it is shameful, is $234 a month. That's the reality that we are dealing with as artists, right? So just something to think about. When we think about the Vera Starks of the world and, and the, the, the Viola Davises of the world, our voices are real and our stories are real. And these experiences are real. So I just want to say it's a privilege to be in this discussion tonight, and I'm also very aware of the year, right? We're in 2013, it's Obama's <coughs> second administration, and the play, the second act of this play takes place in 2003, 10 years ago. And I think, I'll just set that up, because I think that we are all, and one reason why I was uh, excited that we could start talking first is so, so that we would all have our heads full of what are we talking about in 2013 and what room are we in and being in Atlanta and having the tools of sophistication and conversation. Um, so now we're going to go back to 2003 and um, and this panel that has come together in, the fic in a fictional play to talk about a movie that is not real, but is terribly real to them, right? And has been played on TV for years and years and years and years and years, and is an important cultural artifact, this, this uh, movie, The Bell of New Orleans, in which Vera Stark, who's the subject of the play, played a maid called Tilly, um, who was very beautiful, and, in, and she was enslaved. And the movie never really talked about her enslavement. All right. So that's enough. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to our fictional panel, who will seem very real. Uh, and I'm going to let Herb, our moderator, kick us off. We have this academic debate going on, something I am familiar with. Uh, <laughs> where everyone is certain that they're right um, in really the absence of much information. Um, one is never more certain than when one does not have the facts on their side. Um, and um, that's true not only in academia. But, um, yeah. Um, I guess my question is, why does it have to be something big that destroys a person? It seems like it's all of these little constant burden and she's carrying a, a weight from the beginning and then all of these small assaults are then pushing her over the head. Yeah. And so it's really interesting that you're searching for this one thing that destroyed her when it was all of these things. So the Connor, maybe a question for, um, did anyone, did you read the article that was in Sunday's paper, uh, Carrie Washington and Cicely Tyson? I did. Mm -hmm. And Cicely Tyson made a beautiful um, story of when she was cast in Church Bountiful because she'd seen it something like 40 years prior and made the comment at that point in her life, I want my Church Bountiful. And she either spoke it to her agent, I can't recall who, and then you know, 40 years passed and it's offered to her you know, by Horton Foote's daughter, which was lovely. But I'm wondering, are we focused too much on the woman, the person, the race, and not enough on the narrative, the story? I mean, I've, I've been a professional actor for 20 years and I've lost as many roles to women of color as I've gained because I'm a white girl. But I'm always most impacted by the story, by the narrative. And your comment in your letter to Viola, um, who I just ironically had the pleasure of working with, was profound, which is, there's a playwright for you. And I'm wondering, is there a self-correct that any of you see is possible if we get to where we focus on stories, good stories, important stories, narratives that matter? Or does we, do we really do need to make it the woman, the person, the color, the male, the female? I'm just curious. I think I'm not, I'm not quite understanding. When you're saying we focus on, who is the we? 
to do the focusing? Are you saying to make certain work accessible to certain people, or what are you saying? I'm saying as a culture, can we come back to a place where, or get to a place, I don't think I've ever been there, where it is really good stories told by excellent storytellers, the best person for that best role. That's what I'm wondering. Are we, do we, are we going to get there, I guess, in my lifetime, in my niece and nephew's lifetime? That's what I'm wondering. I guess we'll get there. I'm jump in as a dramaturg. I really hope not, um, because uh, uh, to Carlton's question, who am I? So I am someone who owes her career to a man of color. I owe my career to George C. Wolf. Um, I don't know why he wanted a white girl from Wisconsin to do his new plays at the Public Theater, but he did. Thank God for me. Um, and uh, and I. Real, I got, I've gotten to work on a lot of plays that deal with the complication of American narratives about self and American narratives about American identity and really complicated plays about American narratives about race. And I really don't think we're done. Real, I think we're just probing the surface. And I think that the Obama administration opens up a lot of questions about identity and that America for a while wanted to tell simple stories. And now we want to tell really complicated stories. And I think, as a theater artist, that the novels do that well, but theater does it better. <laughs> right. So, but there are two different, if I can interpret what you said through the lens of a sociologist, which is what I am. There are two different questions here. One is the politics of art, okay? So it's all the social structures that support art, it's all the competition within art, it's all of the um, uh, uh, politics of uh, the way in which certain plays get made and who funds them, right? And you're never going to, you know, get rid of all that for great stories, right? That's always going to be part of the equation. So within the politics of art itself, I don't think we can ever get rid of. And I'm, I'm not sure that, I mean, I'm sure that everyone in our and I speak with, you know, someone outside of that world would love to get rid of some of it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, right, yeah, yeah. But let me tell you something, as someone who works at a university, let me tell you, we'd love to get rid of some of it in the university. I mean, I'm sure those of you who work in corporations would love to get rid of some of it in the corporations. I mean, that's just life, right? Politics, in that sense, is part of how we run complex organizational forms, and if anyone can figure out how to get rid of it, um, I'd love to hear it, right? So, so I think that part of your, your question, is their, their sympathy, but the, the, the beauty of some of the plays that we've had the opportunity to talk about here was that they were really steeped in that kind of politics, right? And by that I don't mean, you know, our Congress. I mean the politics of relationships and the politics of, of the relationship between people in settings and in particular situations and particular organizations, and that's what course makes theater so interesting it's you know that's what turns it from just entertainment into something I want to have an ethics on the stage program about right. I yeah. think there's there's yeah. also um, that other thing about the stories that we tell is that a lot of and it, it it has to do with what you were talking about a lot of how we determine what stories we're going to tell mm -hmm. um, it has to do with who we're telling that story to mm -hmm. So that as a black writer, if I know I'm telling a story to a completely African-American audience, because black is so nonspecific, that could be a black Brazilian, they might not have any idea what I'm talking about being a black girl from the west side of Detroit. So if I'm going to tell stories as an African-American writer to a west side of Detroit, that's right, that's right, that's right. I, did, I did that for you. That was for you. But I think that we, we are aware that there are certain things that you can assume that most of the audience will know. If that audience is not an all one race audience, then you're aware that there are certain things that you may think that everyone in your immediate community knows, but other people don't. So then the story kind of becomes, okay, am I going to make sure that the story is wide enough, a net, so that everybody gets it? Or am I going to say, I'm going to tell my specific story and then assume that anybody who's really interested will take the time to figure out what I'm talking about? <laughs> Most of us look at other cultures and we know that there's going to be a moment where if I'm not Japanese, I don't really understand. So I've got to look it up. I've got to figure it out. And I think that's true of us 
as all American people too, that there's so many different kinds of stories where we bring all those things that you're talking about to the story that when we actually get to the narrative, we have such a hard time because we are looking at it through so many racial, sexual, judgmental lenses. And I think as a writer, there's only about five stories that we tell. We're either telling love stories, we're telling war stories, we're telling family stories. And sometimes race is a part of those stories. But most of the time, I don't believe that writers sit out to say, I'm going to tell a story about race. Every now and then you do. And that's usually when somebody made you mad about race and you want to fuss about race. But most of the time, I think, the stories that I want to tell, I'm talking about people falling in love. I'm talking about people trying to raise their children, which are the same stories everybody tells all around the world. So that the specifics that are political are only based on who we're mad at or who we're being oppressed by at that moment. And that depends on where you were born, what neighborhood you live in, how much money your parents make, where you got to go to school, all of those kinds of things. But within all that, you're still telling those same five stories. You're talking about falling in love, having babies, arguing with your mom, all those things that we all say. And I think that we'll get to a point where we don't think every story is different because the person telling it doesn't look just like us. That we'll understand that most stories, unless they're about race, can be told by almost anybody. And you know, every now and then they'll do a mix-up um, version of an American play usually a white American play, and cast all kinds of people in it, sometimes all black folks, like Trip to Bountiful, and it does just fine. And the exotic nature of, oh my God, this play has an all black cast, I think that will fade, and people will realize if it's a good story, anybody can hear it, anybody can tell it, anybody can receive it, unless it's specifically dealing with race, then you got other questions. Unless it's specifically dealing with gender, then you got other questions. But those five stories that we all tell as human beings, I think we are more and more realizing that it doesn't have to be our specific story. And I think most of us who are not um, defined in this country as the mainstream have grown up that way. We read all kinds of stories and identify. I remember reading Gone with the Wind as a little girl in Detroit, and my mother was just through because I was loving it. I mean, it's really well written and all that. And my mother saw me reading it, very political family I grew up in. And my mother said, if you're going to read that book, you need to understand that the people you need to be crying about are not Miss Melanie and not Miss Scarlett, <laughs> but Chrissy and Mammy, because that's you. So don't you be trying to talk about Miss Scarlett and know you want a 17-inch waist because she had a 17-inch waist. No, that was not you. You better be looking at what was happening with the Prissy. And I said, wow, my mom is so hard. You can never get to just just like the story. But of course she was correct. This is a story about slavery. So it's a very complicated deal to be a little black child growing up in an all-black neighborhood and identifying with a slave owner. She was correct. But it also proved to me the power of the writing in that book. Whether or not you think it's a great book or not, once you start reading it, you want to know what's going to happen to Miss Scarlet, what's going to happen to this one, what's going to happen to that one, in a way that catches you up and takes you into very weird places if you are the people who are enslaved in that story, but which also makes you really say, about time Rhett Butler stood up for himself at the end and walked away, or about time this happened or that happened, which is when you realize that the narrative is more powerful than even the things that you know. Even me growing up in a black nationalist household with a mother who said, you better be looking at Mammy and not looking at Scarlett. I'm under the covers at night with a flashlight trying to read about what happened to Melanie and Scarlett. So race is such a complicated thing, but writing is such a powerful thing that it can skew all of that. It can make you look at things in a way that you didn't think you would. Even when you go into it thinking you know exactly how you're going to feel, you really don't. And it's, it's important, I think, that we keep talking about race when it's on our mind. And when it's not on our mind, let's talk about whatever it is. Because sometimes it's not going to be race. We don't only and always talk about race. You know, sometimes we talk about other stuff, right? Even I mean, in all, in all communities, <laughs> you know, we talk about everything. So I think that's right. I think those are the narratives that, that are the ones that, that bring us together and why we can read things from cultures completely different and still cry with those people. Because it's that human thing. Yeah. Okay. I, I just wanted to, to sort of piggyback on what you're saying, but also circle around to what you're saying. I don't know how many of you know the skinny about the trip to Bountiful story. Um, a director, a black 
director, a man, directed the first all black, it was his idea to direct a, an all black cast, Trip to Bountiful, and he did it at a, in Ohio, at one of the Ohio theaters. And then I think it transferred somewhere, right? Yeah. And um, I think it transferred to another theater. <coughs> and he was working desperately with a number of producers to try to bring it to Broadway. Late at night, one night, like 11 o'clock at night, he got a call from a friend of his who's a white director named Michael Wilson, who said, listen, I just want you to know tomorrow morning, and I wanted you to hear it from me first, it's hitting the press that I will be directing an all-black cast of A Trip to Bountiful on Broadway. And I just wanted you to hear that from me. That's all I want to say. Um, I just want to um, say something that I think is missing from the conversation is that um, your art is um, how future generations are going to see you and to see your society. And, and what's missing, I think, and why it's such a, and I'm clear at also like Pearl, like what, what um, is missing and what's going to be missing is future generations looking back on who we are now as the United States and not seeing the black voices that are here. Like, I mean, when we go, we dig up art, we dig up arts of previous civilizations, we go visit monuments, um, we read the Bible, which is an artifact from previous civilizations, and that's how we learn about who these people were, their values, and how the society worked. And I feel like when you're not producing a lot of black art, when, the, when black playwrights are not being produced, that means black playwrights are not being published, that means black writers are not being published, that means these artifacts are not being buried for future generations to dig up. I think that's the biggest tragedy of not actually having black art out there. It's like we won't, it will not, you can't tell the true story of the United States if you don't have black art as a part of that. And I mean, in our history, I mean, I mean, we are producing history right now. Um, well, my, my, my comments are kind of a, not really an aside, but something that you said and something someone earlier said made me think about the power of our own personal stories. I mean, we talk about these complex stories and things being written and being, as an artist, I very much appreciate the value that is, you know, whenever I put something in a book or when something is made into a play. Um, but there's such power in our own personal stories, and I think we take that for granted. And one exercise that I think we as a people, people of color, people, everyone in this room, and I, and, and I want to go back to those type of statements um, um, about the universality of, of our stories, that we don't, sometimes we don't find, we need to be reminded of the value in sharing our own story, even if to other members of our family. I mean, some of us die and go to our graves with stories that are so valuable that if we just took the time to share them with someone else, um, if we just took the sh time to share them out loud, if we in some way were just um, more open to being in exchange and in dialogue with what it means to be us, with other people and not simply in our head. Um, you know, I think about the, the work that I'm doing right now is a collection of personal stories. And as I read these, what seem to be very basic personal stories that people are sharing, they're so rich in complexity. And I wonder, is this the first time you've said that out loud? Is this the first time you've taken time to actually write down that story of you know, when you were in the grocery store. And what would it mean if you decided to share that with someone else? And what would it mean if now that that's shared, that became part of our collective moral consciousness, our collective story, our collective narrative, or the story that at least your grandchild could be able to tell? Um, so, so that's one thing. You are a powerful, dynamic person, and your story is meaningful and has, vi and has value and is ultimately, I think, the most important thing outside of what is written and that actually makes the screen. That is what I personally think. Um, but then as it relates to our stories of race and sexual orientation, or um, a little bit of a side, but it's something that I want to put out there, another rhetorical question for everyone, and I want you to think about it even if it, even if it just hits you when you walk out of the door. Um, but when, think about the story of when you first discovered that you were fill in the blank. And I'd like you to fill in that blank with your racial identity or your sexual orientation. 
when did I first learn that I was? Think about that story. Think about the implications of it. Think about it in the context of what we're talking about up here. Think about the implications of it in your own life. And think about who you'd like to share that with as a way of engaging yourself in this dialogue, engaging yourself in this ongoing collective consciousness of storytelling and narrative that is ultimately formative to what it means to be a human being, America, and that will totally, when you think about it, it'll blow your socks away into how you even approach conversations about race, and it will make them not simply be in terms of this kind of polemic or this dichotomy between black and white or gay street or all these things that we seem to think of in these confined boxes. I want to say that I believe race is like the thread that binds our, I would say, world, the culture, our society. And I would hate to have theater that didn't explore race. And particularly, I'm very proud to be an African American woman and to come from um, a race of people who have endured great injustice and are still here and are still thriving despite all of that we've been through. So I would hate to see race taken out of theater. Um, for example, I like August Wilson. He's one of my favorite playwrights. And I would not enjoy to see that play as an all-white cast because it's specifically about the African-American experience. And I think the African-American African -American experience is so rich that I would not want to see it taken away. And not to say that any other culture is not rich as well, but I think all of our cultures together, threaded together, make the cloth. And without those threads, it would just fall apart. I just want to make a comment about this line of conversation. You know, race in the United States is a particular historical story. It's very different in other countries. And, um, you know, because of the history of slavery here, race in this country um, is much more like England where there's a history of slavery than it is in France where you have much less um, historical <coughs> racism and you, you actually have a much, race is not their primary way of thinking about difference. But the underlying truth is that every society thinks about difference. And the difference may be ethnic, the difference may be racial, the difference may be religious. Um, you know, you have, it may be class, well, it's almost always class too. Um, and you can have North Korea and South Korea, same race, but profound differences based on culture and history, right? Um, and you can have two different races that have a common identity against a third race. So it's very, very different, and our particular story um, it, um, is a powerful one because of the history of slavery primarily, which is a very different modern story than race anywhere else, except a couple of other places that had the same story. And that's what I think makes it so fraught and powerful and, and, and complicated, and why I agree that in this culture we're never going to completely escape that. It will always be part of our historical memory. You know, I think about sexual orientation right now, right? So that's something profoundly changing, even as we, you know, at this moment. It's an incredible thing to watch, right? Um, I, I remember the moment for me, when you asked the moment we realized we were white. I had a different moment. I had a, um, when my daughter was 12, she was studying for her bat mitzvah. And the woman who was teaching her was a lesbian rabbi, right? And one day, Ariel said to me, um, is is Deborah going to marry Chris? And I said, she can't marry Chris. And she said, why not? I said, because it's against the law for two people of the same sex to get married. She went, what? <laughs> what? Isn't that, that the craziest thing I ever heard? And what was so amazing to me about it was, when I was 12, it never would have occurred to me to question why, why that was crazy. It was so pervasive that, first of all, I probably knew it. I don't remember. But if my parent had said to me, yeah, two people, two men and two women can't get married, I would have thought that was, yeah, that makes sense. Because that's what was, right? So that was the moment that I really realized how much things have changed in the ether, that it made no sense to her, right? Why didn't it make sense to her? It made sense to me when I was 12. So you have these moments of, you know, these real moments of change, 
things can yeah. change, right? But even if, you know, 25, 30 years from now, sexual orientation becomes a non-issue in our society, we still have this narrative history of it that will always inform our understanding of it. And I think that that is even in some ways more deeper and richer, richer and not in a positive sense, with, uh, with race. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, um, we've spent the last two days here at Emory and tomorrow with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been here. And well, I might add Paul did an extraordinary job moderating the Well, thank you. It was, it was an honor to be sitting with him. But, you know, we, we, the, he's an extraordinary visionary in his culture. Because he said, look, you know, we come from, from a very rich heritage, but we need to blend in the best of other heritages. So he started, you know, he said, all my monks need to be trained in science, modern science. And that's the Emory Tibet Science Initiative where, you know, we have, there are now textbooks that Emory faculty have written that we've translated together into Tibetan. Um, but I, I was just struck by the vision of this man who said, uh, you know, I'm not going to, Culturally, I'm not going to indraw. I'm going to, you know, out, he says anything that we believe that is wrong, we need to. Anytime science disproves something I believe is a Buddhist, I need to drop that belief. And he said, by the way, he said, <laughs> what? But he also said, by the way, he also said, by, I mean, he, he also said, by the way, which is a great lesson to us in Western religions, he said, you know, part of Buddhist belief is in detachment, emotional detachment, right? So that you can have clarity. He said, which means that I can't be too attached to Buddhism either. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to say is that I think the whole issue of race will go away when race disconnects from power. That's the, the crux of the problem. It's, it's the imbalance of power. It has nothing to do with color. No, um, so let's thank our uh, panel. Our um, a couple very quick messages. First of all, how much longer is Choir Boys play? It closes on Sunday. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Uh, that is uh, also has uh, a bit about race, but is mostly about um, sexual orientation and bullying, and really, really interesting. Choir Boys, excellent, excellent, excellent production. Um, definitely go see Vera Stark, and uh, please come and, uh, again, to our uh, Ethics in the Arts programs. If you we don't have your name, put it on our mailing list. There's lots of really great stuff that we do. Thanks, everybody. Take, if you haven't, check, that, check out uh, Carlton's Fifty Shades of Black and on the uh, back wall.